it's a great way to live. Let's pray before we begin. Father, I thank you for, again, for these hymns that remind us of spiritual truth and help us to live in Christ, to be crucified with Christ, to, to take up our cross as the Bible talks about these things. The cross is, is a symbol, it's an instrument of execution, and we should die to ourselves. We are, we are treating ourselves and living as if we are dead and and it's Christ that's living and so Christ gets to make the decisions for his glory for his purposes and not our own not our own credit not our own purposes and plans and I pray that you would help us to live this way and Lord if there are some here that are unsettled at that idea and and maybe puzzled at what that means exactly I pray that you would show them why that is maybe it's because they're lost maybe it's because They've never lived for any length of time in that state of of giving over full control to you, Lord. And I pray that you would accomplish that in our lives so that you will be glorified. I pray that you would speak to us now from the word of God. Thank you for the time that we have to open up the the scriptures and consider what it has for us. I just pray that you'd bless this in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week, we looked at the ingredients of fellowship. We discovered that fellowship begins as a partnership or investment in a common cause. And and humanly speaking, in an earthly sense, that's that's what happens. You, you, You begin a fellowship of sorts, this relationship, and it begins because you're both investing in a common cause, a common purpose. And it's on purpose, it's purposeful that this starts. It's not accidental. It begins at a moment in time. We saw that that fellowship is found in a shared belief system and lifestyle, a shared occupation and also shared experiences. In these things, we have fellowship. We have fellowship because of shared experiences. And I've, I've noticed that. I, when I was a teenager, I remember uh, there, was, there were some humorous things that happened in our youth group. And, and I was made aware how very quickly those humorous experiences that we shared began to bind together in, in, a, in a form of fellowship, um, even though I had very different, a very um, significant spiritual differences from the other person. And it wasn't the kind of friend that I wanted to be close with because they didn't really have a love for God. They weren't saved. And so, but it was interesting to me how even though we had those differences, this shared humorous experience started to create this bond that spiritually was not good for me. And so uh, I was made aware of that. But, but we, can, we can have this sort of fellowship in, in shared experiences, but also a shared occupation. You have fellowship with people that maybe are in the same work industry as you um, or a shared belief system and lifestyle. And that really applies to the Christian life as well. Fellowship is born in the sharing of important elements of life. We also saw that true biblical fellowship produces close bonds with each other. You can have fellowship in a generic sense for for many different reasons, but biblical fellowship produces very close bonds. It produces joy, and there's, there's great joy in that fellowship. Most importantly, we saw that biblical fellowship begins between us and God. And if we have that fellowship with God, what comes along with it is forgiveness, understanding of truth, forgiveness of our sins, understanding of truth, and much more. And when we begin to fellowship with each other, as a result of our fellowship that's already happening with the Father, then we, this direction, with other people, we enjoy many sweet blessings as a result. When our fellowship is founded in all of our fellowship individually with the Father. There's, there are many great blessings to discover there in fellowship. And to, that, was, that was the ingredients of fellowship last week. Tonight, I'd like us to look at the importance of fellowship. And it is a necessary part of our lives. It is, is important for every one of us to have fellowship with the right people. First of all, we need fellowship. We need fellowship as humans, not just as Christians on that level, on the level of of the spiritual life, but also just humanly speaking, in the physical realm, we need fellowship. Um, I think that if you were to take a poll, if we were to go around and and take a poll on a scale of 1 to 10, how much do you crave 
interaction with other people. You'd probably have some people that are at a 9 or a 10, meaning as much as possible, that's what I want. And then you have other people closer to 1. Now, I just maybe a little bit, but not much more than that. We'd be all over the spectrum. We all crave it to varying degrees. But don't let, if, if you would be more down near the 1 or the 2, don't let those introvert or maybe a hermit tendency don't let that keep you from adequately fellowshipping with others because we all need it. Turn to Genesis chapter 2, and God tells us that we need it. Uh, I think it might be easy for us to just sort of uh, take our emotional temperature, so to speak, and decide whether or not we're the sort of person that needs that. But that is very subjective, and that can change with the seasons of life. But just because we decide that we may not need it doesn't mean we're actually correct about that. Uh, God tells us some things about ourselves. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, it says, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and so on. God tells us that it's not good for man to be alone. And we might say, well, that's only about marriage. Well, if it's not good for, for the man to be alone, so he needs a wife, it's not good for people to be alone. God creates a help, a helper who is meet, who is suited. And he, he did that for Adam Immediately after God created man, he created the garden, he put the man in the garden, he says, this is your job, here are your boundaries, I want you to name the animals, dress the garden, keep the garden, don't eat of that tree, you can eat of all the other trees. Immediately after he sets up these structures of life for Adam, he says, and you need some company. Let me give you a companion. God states that he needs company, and, and you might say again, well this is, um, this is only about the marriage relationship, but Paul, the Apostle Paul in Corinthians talks about it, it is better if, if children, if, if saints, children of God, if saints, adult saints, can remain single because then they'll have more time to serve the Lord. So if it was, if it was God's will for every single person to be married, you know, we would, we would see that reflected in Scripture. God isn't speaking just of marriage here when he talks about companionship. We need that fellowship. We need companionship. I have noticed personally that, that my thinking can become, can turn in a, in a negative direction if I'm alone too much. If I don't have that interaction and just maybe another perspective, another focus, I can become very self-focused when I'm alone a lot and just thinking about me and my troubles and all these things. And fellowship is good for us, as, we, as we'll see here. As humans, we need fellowship. We need companionship for many reasons, but also as Christians. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 10. Of course, we don't fellowship with each other simply because it's a human need. There are very good spiritual reasons that we're going to look at tonight why we need fellowship. And we may not crave it as much as the next person does, but let's not let our um, lesser craving, if we want to put it that way, let that keep us away from fellowship, from adequately engaging in fellowship. Hebrews chapter 10, look at verse 23. The writer here is talking about, let's be faithful in the Lord. Let's, let's hold fast the truth that we've received. Verse 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. He's talking about let's be faithful because if we fall away, there is going to be judgment. There's going to be some, some problems here. Let's, let's 
consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. Let's hold fast the profession of our faith. And we know this verse, verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. And we know that means church. And so don't stay away from church. You need to be in church. And why? Why do we need to be in church? Well, you know, you need to hear the preaching. Well, you can do that from the live stream. That's not assembling. If we're just watching the live stream at home, we're not assembling. So there's something about assembling that's really important, and we find it here in the text. Hold fast a profession. Let's consider one another another, to provoke unto love and good works, exhorting one another. So much the more as you see the day approaching. Yes, we need to come together for, for preaching and teaching. We need to be taught, but we need to exhort one another. We need to help each other. We need to we need to to bond ourselves together, we need to be helping each other. Galatians chapter two, verse or Galatians chapter six, verse two says, "Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ." Whether you're married or not, you need to help others and be helped in these spiritual ways to exhort each other, encourage each other, and it's really helpful to me. I've noticed that especially recently. It's a real blessing to get together with God's people and to fellowship, and I notice that that need that I have to be around everybody and to to, to talk about the Lord and to, to talk about maybe your week and what, what's going on in your life, what's going on in my life, and we can encourage each other and help each other. This is fellowship, and we need it. Fellowship ought to be purposeful. If, if Christian fellowship were to be only about companionship and society and familiar intercourse, like, hey, it's good to just be with another, another warm body in the room, you know, uh, companionship. It's good to just, you know, set, stand around and, and, and shoot the breeze about the weather, you know, and, and politics or, or familiar intercourse, you know, your favorite fruit, food or my favorite color. If, if that's the extent of our fellowship, it's missing something very important. The word fellowship, a couple of the definitions talk about partnership and joint interest, communion. Of course, we know what the word communion is. It's a, it's a very deep level of of communing and 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 fellowship and communication and unity partnership again the first human companion eve was created by god to be a helper a help who was suited for adam a helper a help meet for adam together they were supposed to work together the two of them were supposed to work together, not just socialize or talk or hang out together. They were there to work together to accomplish more than, than Adam could have alone. And Christians should have the same focus. That's what our fellowship should be geared towards. It is, it is nice to stand and to, to, to socialize. It's nice to have each other over for dinner and just, just to have fun. And that's not wrong, but if that's all our relationship is about, if that's the deepest that our fellowship goes, it's missing something. We ought to fellowship together to help each other, to encourage each other, to exhort each other, to give each other maybe a, a perspective shift or, a, or a, a reset in our thinking. You know, I was getting a little bit you know, uh, self-focused in this, and you help me see it a little bit differently. Thank you. And now I'm, I'm sort of uh, got, got the ship righted a little bit as I go on here for the Lord. We should have the same focus. Again, God, as, as we see in Genesis chapter 2, God created Adam. He gave him his job description and then created a helper for him. In our individual lives, you and I have our job to do. You have your role in your family, in your life, your job, whatever God's called you to do. I have mine, and that's our focus, but we can help each other as we go along, and we ought to connect with each other in doing that. I would suggest that the primary purpose of fellowship is not leisure and fun. It is to help each other in fulfilling the will of the master, and we can have fun while we're doing that. But the focus of fellowship is not just fun and leisure. We need fellowship. So don't let yourself believe that it's not very necessary for you. It's your loss if you neglect fellowship. Seek it. Cultivate it. Work on it. Because we all need it. We need fellowship. Secondly, fellowship identifies us. Fellowship is important. Again, we're talking about the importance of fellowship. Fellowship is important because it is an identifier. We know the the saying, I didn't know is an English proverb until I looked it up, but the English proverb says, birds of a feather flock together. 
you find the same kinds of birds hanging out in a flock. And that is true of humans as well. And that is how fellowship works. You somehow find the people that are most like you. And fellowship identifies us. You, you, you see in the news even celebrities or politicians, you find out who they're hanging around with, that tells you a lot about them. You've probably seen, you know, maybe there are people uh, that you know, they start hanging around with the wrong kind of crowd, that tells you something about them. And it says something about you and me, who we spend our time with, who we, who we like to talk to. It identifies us in a couple of different ways. It identifies us in the eyes of others. Other people identify who we are by seeing who we fellowship with and by who we spend our time with. We, don't, we shouldn't live our lives according to what others think because others can think wrong. But what others think does matter. The Bible is clear about that. Matthew 5, 16, Jesus says to his disciples, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Don't hide your testimony and the work that you're doing for God. Don't don't cover it up as though you're ashamed. Let others see it, not so that you can get the glory, but so that other people can see it and give the Father the glory. Let him get the glory. It does matter what people think, but we shouldn't guide our lives according to what other people think. Of course, we know 1 Thessalonians 5.22 says, abstain from all appearance of evil. It's obvious that we should abstain from all evil, but the appearance of evil has its application in what others see. So it doesn't matter what others see. And so fellowship is an identifier in the eyes of others. Other people are watching your life. What do they see? How do they identify you? based on the people that you fellowship with, the people that I fellowship with. Turn over to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 6. Ephesians 5, 6. Uh, fellowship is important because it identifies us, and we need to be careful who we fellowship with. Now, and I'll, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but we, we seek to reach other people with the gospel. That's, I'm not talking about that. Seeking to reach the lost and spending time with them in order to reach them for Christ, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about biblical fellowship, this communion with other people. This biblical fellowship should happen with people that are like us, that are like the Lord, because our fellowship should be grounded and based in our fellowship with the Father. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 6, it says, "...let no man deceive you with vain words." For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. And I I remember when I was younger, I would have a hard time speaking up when people I was around would would maybe tell dirty jokes or whatever. I I would be embarrassed to, you know, I don't want to make myself a target, so I'm just not going to say anything. But but if you hang around and, and, and say nothing when that sort of thing goes on, you are tacitly approving of it and, and voicing, in a sense, fellowship with that. The Bible says we are supposed to reprove the unfruitful works of darkness and to have no fellowship with them. If we are able to have fellowship with those who are engaged in the unfruitful works of darkness, if we're able to have fellowship with them, It's because we have something in common with them, and that should concern us. That fact, if we have fellowship with those sorts of people, that is noticed by a lost world, especially by those who are looking for ways to attack the work of God. Let's look over at Matthew chapter 11. Matthew 11, the world and and the devil really is behind it, but people are constantly looking for reasons to attack and criticize the work of God and God's people. And so the people that we fellowship with could be used against us if we are having fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. We need to be careful about this. It's an identifier 
uh, for us in the eyes of other people. Matthew 11, verse 16 says, But whereunto shall I liken this generation? It is like unto children sitting in the marketplace and calling unto their fellows and saying, We have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned unto you, and ye have not lamented. And here's the criticism. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He hath a devil. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified of her children. The devil is always looking for opportunities to attack and criticize. And if we spend time and, and we have fellowship with those, fellowship with those who are engaged in the unfruitful works of darkness, we are identifying ourselves with them. And that does not glorify the Father. Look over at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul shows a distinction, a difference between spending time with lost sinners in the world and keeping company as brethren with those same kinds of sinners. 1 Corinthians 5 verse 9 says, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. Don't be around fornicators. Well, what do you mean, Paul? And here he clarifies it. Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or with the or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. I don't mean that you shouldn't spend any time with anybody who has ever committed these kinds of sins, because if that were true, you'd have to leave the world. Because that the world is full of those kinds of people. Verse 12, or verse 11, But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner. With such an one, no, not to eat. What's the difference here? Well, out there, and, and I say out there because they're, they're outside the church, out there are all kinds of wicked people, but they need the Lord. They need to be saved. They are, they are eternal souls on their way to hell, and we have to reach them. We can't reach them unless they, we go spend time with them in some way. And so we, we have to go minister to them. But going out there and, and extending ourselves to minister to them, to preach to them, to witness to them, that is different than being in here in our church, accompanying with people who do the same things. And that's what Paul is saying. There's a big difference here. If there is someone who calls themselves a brother, or let's just say is a brother, we have fellowship with them. We're, we're brethren. We're the same. But if they're living like people out there live... They're not the same. There's something very different. And so we need, to, we need to create some separation and not fellowship as brethren with those people because we're identifying ourselves with them if we do that, if we, if we fellowship with them. It identifies us to others, but it also identifies us to ourselves. And we can do a sort of a self-checkup and, 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 and examine ourselves. What kind of people do I most enjoy spending time with? What kind of people do I really fellowship with? And sometimes we can, we can um, justify our heart condition by saying, you know, yeah, this, this friend of mine, they're kind of like this, they're kind of like that. They, they're not really where I am spiritually, but, you know, the Lord knows my heart, and the Lord knows that, that you know, I have a difference in desires, and so we can kind of excuse me bit how we spend our time but if we're honest with ourselves when we look at the people that we associate with the people that we fellowship with if we're honest we'll see the kind of person that we are deep down look at Matthew chapter 9 Matthew chapter 9 it's good for us to examine ourselves and see who we fellowship with and find out if that's the kind of person we actually want to be Evil communications, the Bible says, corrupt good manners. And I've heard of, of people who said, yeah, that person is lost and they need to be saved and I know how I'm going to win them. I'm going to go be a buddy with them and we're going to be best friends and I'm going to, going to show them how a Christian ought to be and they're going to want to be a Christian that way. And it doesn't end up, end up well. When you try to fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, it doesn't end up well. Matthew chapter 9, verse 10. And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. 
Go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Christ's example, of course, is best. He was not fellowshipping with these people, as we'll read in a moment. Christ was ministering to those people. He was, he was being a friend to them, but he was not going to these publicans and sinners for fellowship. He was seeking to reach down and pull them out of their sin and save them. Look at Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. We see the kind of people that Jesus identified with, the people that he claimed as his own. Matthew chapter 12, verse 46. While he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak with him. Mary and Jesus' half-siblings. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother, and who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples, and said, Behold my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. These are the people that I fellowship with. Many people in the world place a very, very high value on family relationships. And I think family relationships are important. I think if at all possible, we ought to have close relationships with our family. But Jesus says there's a, there's a closer relationship than, than blood, family, spiritual family. The people who are doing the will of the Father, he said, these are my mother and my brethren and my sisters. These are the people that I fellowship with. These are the people Christ claimed as his own. And claiming them this way is very different from him associating and, and, and spending time with the publicans and sinners. There's a very big difference. And so I hope you understand the distinction that I'm making here. When we fellowship, it should be with people who are like us, more, more particularly people who fellowship with the Father. We need to fellowship with people who fellowship with the Father because that should be like us. We should be fellowshipping with the Father. And too often, you can tell somebody's spiritual condition by looking at their friends, and it, it's an identifier. Who do you associate with and why? With whom do you have the most in common? Who are your brethren in the sense that the Lord used it? 2 Corinthians 6.14 says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? Don't, don't bind yourself into this yoke of, of many, there are many different applications that we could make as far as a yoke goes. Don't bind yourself together with unbelievers because a, you're a believer, he's, he's writing to a church, you are a believer, you have fellowship with the Father, don't bind yourself and, and, and maybe contract yourself into some sort of agreement with an unbeliever because there's no fellowship there. You're trying to pull together and work together and there's no fellowship. And one of you is going to change if, if there's a change and it's probably not going to be the lost person. Generally, that's not how it goes. Ephesians 5.11, again, it says, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Jesus reproved the publicans and sinners. He told them what they needed to hear. He didn't approve of their lifestyle. He did love them, but he didn't approve of their lifestyle. He reproved them in order so that they could be saved. 1 John 1, 6 says, if we say that we have fellowship with him, with Christ, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. This fellowship is an identifier. We can't fellowship with the Lord and walk in darkness. It's impossible. If you struggle with reproving the works of darkness and would rather cultivate intimate relationships with these people who, who do these works, I think it'd be good to consider if you're truly saved. 1 John 1, 7, the very next verse says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. We know from the example of, of Lot that it's possible to sear your conscience. And maybe you've noticed that. The more time you spend around lost people and at a job sometimes, that's, that's unavoidable. You have to spend time with lost people. But the more that you sort of open your heart to them, 
spiritually speaking, the more it changes you and sears your conscience and the wickedness doesn't bother you like it used to. And that ought to concern us if, that, if we see that happening. On the other hand, there's great joy and communion and fellowship between saints who have forsaken all to follow Christ. It's an identifier. And, and you might identify yourself as not being where you ought to be. And you know that because you fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. But on the other side, you might say, the, the only real fellowship that I have is with saved people, people who also love the Lord with all their heart. There is much sweetness there. Matthew 19, 27 says, Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And every one that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. It is a blessing to fellowship in our shared experiences, which sometimes can be shared sacrifices, shared trials. And we can and should encourage each other in that because, you know what, if you've forsaken all and followed the Lord, if I've done that, we, we go through hard times sometimes because of that. But be encouraged, friend. The Lord's going to reward us one day. The Lord's going to bless us as a result of that. And we can have fellowship in that together. We can encourage each other. We can help each other. What your fellowship says about you is very important. It identifies us. Thirdly, fellowship changes our focus. Fellowship is important because we need it. Fellowship is important because it identifies us. Fellowship is important because it changes our focus. Look at Philippians chapter 2. We need fellowship because we tend to be very selfish people. Fellowship with the Spirit and with the saints gets our focus off of self and onto the Lord and His people. Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 says, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. That's fellowship. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. I think I've been most blessed in fellowship when I stop saying, boy, I sure need some fellowship. I need somebody to come help me. I need somebody to come encourage me. You know, I've had a really hard day and I need, to, I need somebody to come do this for me. When I say, I wonder if somebody else needs encouragement. I wonder if somebody else needs help. I wonder if I can be a blessing to somebody else. That's when I'm most blessed in fellowship. Look, every man on, not on his own things, but every man also in the things of others. Let this mind be in you, verse 5, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. And then we read on the humility that Christ displayed and went all the way to the cross in order to save us. The focus. He didn't put the focus on himself. He put the focus on others and meeting others' needs. And when we fellowship with each other, like really fellowship, again, just shooting the breeze, talking about the weather, that doesn't really get us anywhere. But when we open our heart to people and say, you know what, I'm, I'm having a tough day. And, and if you could pray with me about this, when we do that for each other and you hear about their trials, you hear about their difficulties, it gets your focus off yours. I know it does that for me. And, and, Sometimes we can be scared to, to fellowship that way. What are people going to think of me if I admit that I'm having a tough day? What are people going to think of me if I admit that I'm struggling with something? But again, Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. I, I can't bear your burden if you won't tell me about it. And sometimes it's, it's been frustrating for me. I, I want to help you, but you have to let me. And if, you, if we won't let other people help us, then we're robbing them of a blessing as well. But if we're willing to help others, we'll find that fellowship changes our focus and helps us in return. 
it's good for us to fellowship because it changes our focus. Hebrews 10, 24, again, we read this earlier, but it says, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. There are many ways to exhort one another. Sometimes it can be in the form of encouragement, just telling what God did in your life. I just want to praise the Lord because he showed me this verse, and I don't, I don't even know that you need it. I just want to praise the Lord, and that can be an encouragement. It's fellowship in the Lord. I have fellowship with the Lord and I want to speak of that and and, and speak from that and you have it as well. You speak from that and we fellowship with each other and help each other. It gets the focus off us and onto the Lord and onto others. Kind of related to this is a major key in sustaining victory over sin and growing in the Lord is replacing old habits and struggles with new habits and and service. It's one thing to say, I I keep sinning in this way, I keep sinning when this happens, and so I'm going to stay away from that. I'm going to take that out of my life, and we should do that. But a sustained victory is not only in removal. It's in replacement. Okay, I just just removed something from my life, now there's a void. What am I going to fill the void with? I need to fill it with good habits, new habits, and service. I need to put this to practice. I need to help others. I need to get the focus off me and off my temptation. Replace old habits and struggles with new habits and service. By focusing on God and serving God and others, you'll not be obsessing and dwelling on your own temptations. And sometimes we fail just because we can't stop thinking about our temptations. But when we focus on others and if they need help and how to help them, it gets our mind and our focus off of our struggles. And fellowship can help do that. It changes our focus. Lastly, fellowship is important because it reflects reality. It just reflects what is already true. Fellowship is important because it reflects what the Lord has done. And this is perhaps the most important point of tonight's message. Christ's church is carefully fitted together. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 talks about this, and we won't read it for sake of time. But over and over, the Apostle Paul is writing, and he talks about it being a body, and it's fitted together. And just like a physical body has legs and hands and feet and all these body parts that perform different functions, eyes and ears and mouth, and, and every part has its own function, a church is that way. And we're fitted together, and we're gifted to perform and do the things that God has gifted us to do. And when we fellowship... We are acknowledging that and we are acting according to that. We need that fellowship because we're gifted to help each other. Christ's church is carefully fitted together. He did it on purpose. Every member has an important and a unique and God-ordained role. We are separate and different, but we are tightly connected and fitted. The Lord did that. He fitted it together carefully. And we know, turn to Romans chapter 12, we know that a body of parts, a body of parts can accomplish more than a body part. And that's fairly obvious. My whole body can do more than my foot could alone. And you are the same way. You can do a lot more as part of the whole than you can do alone. We can do a lot more for the Lord together than we could do separately. Romans chapter 12 verse 4 says, For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, same role, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another, having then gifts differing. According to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness, let love be without dissimulation, and so on. God has given grace and has gifted us spiritually. I don't get to take credit for mine. You don't get to take credit for yours. They're all from the Lord by His grace, but we ought to use them. And if we don't fellowship and connect with each other and bond with each other and use these gifts, we are failing the body that God has put us in. We're failing to perform our role. We're failing to help the body. And this is, this is encouraging because sometimes 
we can beat ourselves up and convince ourselves that we're not as good as the next person or that we don't have very much to offer. What can I do? I'm only this. I'm not that. But spiritual gifts, again, they don't come from us. They come from the Spirit of God. And instead of focusing on ourselves and comparing ourselves to others, if we focus on the Lord, walking with Him and helping others, we'll find that God has gifted us to edify the body. You have a gift that this body needs. And if you focus on that role and on the Lord, you can do that through fellowship in part. Every church member has something that the church, the body, needs. God does that on purpose. 1 Corinthians 12, 18 says, But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath pleased him. What can I do? I'm just this. I'm not that. Well, when we say that sort of thing, we're criticizing the one who put us in the body, as though he made a mistake. Fellowship is important because it reflects reality. Fellowship, help each other. That's what God put you here to do. When you fellowship with your brothers and sisters in Christ, you are reinforcing an area of need that you have because we all need fellowship. You're helping yourself as well as helping them. When you fellowship with those who are disciples of Christ, you are demonstrating commonality with them. You are identifying yourself with them in the eyes of the world and in the eyes of, of those in the church. Every child of God should desire this kind of reputation or identification. When you fellowship with the members of, the, of your church, you are cultivating important relationships that are ordained by God, and you're placing yourself in a position to edify the body. Walk with God, and you'll find divine help to exercise the spiritual gifts given you by Almighty God. I mentioned earlier in the prayer time the idea of walking with God, and He'll give us the words to say in the moment when we need it. Walk with God, and He'll help us to exercise those spiritual gifts when others need that. The Lord Jesus Christ gave Himself for His church, and He's working to strengthen and preserve it. He wants to use people in His work. That includes each of us. And He does that partly through fellowship, as we fellowship with each other. Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for it, that He might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. The word of God is our rule and guide for living, but God gives spiritual gifts that are coordinated with the word of God, and you can be used, you can be a vessel, an instrument in the hands of God to be a blessing to this body. And that happens partly through fellowship. Fellowship is important. By fellowship, we may have needs met, we may forge our te testimony, and we may edify the Lord's body. This is the importance of fellowship. And so let's seek it. Let's cultivate it. Let's build it. It takes effort. Uh, any, any kind of relationship, any kind of relationship takes effort and takes maintenance. And so fellowship is no different but it is valuable and it's worthwhile and we should we should seek it and do it and we'll be blessed when we do let's pray father we thank you for the fellowship that we have in christ these are the bonds that matter life changes seasons of life change interests and occupations change life situations and and our bodies change our minds change our hearts change but the lord never changes and when we fellowship with the lord we will always have something to to fellowship around and fellowship over with other people who also fellowship with god help us to cultivate fellowship on that level we can talk about temporal things and and temporary things but that's not the kind of fellowship that blesses the soul and that edifies the body we ought to seek fellowship on a spiritual level and i pray that you would help us to do this it takes unselfish behavior it takes a, a focus that is turned toward others and others needs a servant's heart and i pray that you would help us to have this but lord we know that whatever we give you and give others for your glory 
we are so often blessed much more in return. And so you are not our debtor. I pray that you would help us to fellowship with others and to seek to build up and encourage and exhort and edify for your glory. And we know that you're pleased with that. I pray that you would encourage us tonight. Help us to be encouraged as we go out the second half of the week. To be lights in our world. To, to not hide our works and not hide our, our walk with you. But to, to shine brightly so that a lost world would give glory to the Father and what he's done in our lives. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good to see you tonight. Thank you for your attention. Before you leave tonight, take some time to fellowship. Let's build these relationships. We're going to be, again, if you can reply to my email regarding Memorial Day, that'd be a great time of fellowship for some fun, but maybe some work.